studies research rooted in particular in our agricultural research and extension work across the globe. Now, this history is reflected in some of our distinctive research facilities that I hope many of you have the opportunity to see in the morning, such as our crop and dairy research facilities, the Cocoa Quarantine Center, one of my own personal favorites, um, and the Museum of English Rural Life. It's also reflected in the interdisciplinary research in centers such as the Walker Institute, exploring future climate and implications on people's lives and livelihoods. But today, our research in development is not just within agriculture, but also in metrology and climate and geography, economics, politics, modern languages and linguistics, law. It all addresses questions at the heart of development studies, but also more widely the crisis of the Anthropocene. So I'm delighted to have colleagues and students from across the university in these different departments here joining the GSA conference for this wider conversation. So before handing over, let me just briefly come back to the climate strikes that you saw um, hopefully outside and uh, that, that, that I'm wearing and probably some other colleagues as well on their, uh, on their shirts and the past. Um, what I found there a really useful conversation starter about discussing um, uh, the climate emergency. And conversations are, of course, what the next days of the GSA conference are about. So let me therefore conclude by wishing you an interesting and challenging set of conversations in the panels, in the corridors, over coffee or other drinks. And I hope that you can all make the most opportunity of the opportunity to meet in person again. So thank you again. Welcome to the University of Reading. I'm delighted to hand over to Alex Bernal, who is chair of the local organizing committee, who will lead you to the rest of the day. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dominic, for that, that introduction and for uh, for welcoming us, welcoming us all to um, to Reading as well. Um, so, as Dominic mentioned, my, my name is Alex Sarnel. Um, I'm a lecturer here at the University of Reading, and I've also had the pleasure too of um, of, of working as the the convener for this conference. Um, but of course, working with my my colleagues based in the Global Development Division. Um, it, with the university management and with Nomad IT, of course, who are the conference administrators. So I just very briefly want to say um, a couple of words about the theme, about this idea of the Anthropocene. And indeed, Dominic was talking a little bit there about some of the some of the issues that we face when we discuss this, this concept. Um, I mean, the reason we wanted to choose the Anthropocene, because we wanted something that was very contemporary, but also something that we felt reflected the, the strengths here at the University of, of Reading. Um, and as, as, as we know, or as many of us know, this idea of the Anthropocene, this, this emphasizes um, the impacts of humans on the natural world, and this is, this is well known. Um, but further than this, something else we're also interested in is also in how sort of human relationships with the natural world, with the environment, are becoming seemingly increasingly complex, increasingly difficult to manage, and seemingly um, beyond the sort of capacity of human systems and human development systems to respond to and to manage. So these are some of the, the key ideas we wanted to bring into the conference in thinking about the Anthropocene in relation to ideas such as uh, complexity, comparison, um, uh, precarity, and um, these these sort of notions, risk, these 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 kinds of ideas. So, um, and I think a good example of that, for example, is the the, the COVID nineteen pandemic that we've all all lived through. I mean, this is something that emerged um, for many was unexpected, for others, of course, less so, less less unexpected, but something that's emerged out of a conjoined human animal um, system. And something that once was released was seemingly kind of beyond beyond control, exceeded the capacity of human agency or human capabilities to, to respond to. So these are some of the ideas we want to explore as, as part of this, this conference. And think about the Anthropocene as an influential idea. So what are the implications for development? Um, but also bearing in mind the Anthropocene also is a contested idea as well, and for lots of different reasons. But of course, this is a, a good thing for us because as a learned community of scholars, researchers, and practitioners, 
we like to talk about and discuss these different ideas and what the implications are for development interventions and for development practice. So I'll just finish up very briefly by mentioning um, three key questions that we're interested in, in exploring um, as part of this conference. The first sort of theme is around development crises, old and new. So this idea that you know, somehow the world is increasingly um, in perpetual state of crisis. And so what does this actually mean for development? What new crises might emerge in the future? And can we anticipate and can we respond to them adequately? The second thing we're interested in is this notion of these notions of agency, uh, knowledge, and uh, governance. So given this um, seemingly increasing sort of lack of control over the natural world and, what, and how the environment affects us, what does this mean for, for management of natural systems? Um, and how might some of the failures of traditional institutions to manage the environment, to manage the natural world, in light of that, what new approaches to, to governance might we need? And finally, thinking about um, issues around themes around connections, care and intersectionality as well. So what does the Anthropocene, what does thinking about the Anthropocene mean for how we theorize and think about development going forward? What does it mean for groups historically and presently marginalized based on gender, race, disability, or other indicators of otherness? And how can diverse voices from marginalized groups be, be better heard? So those are some of the, the questions that um, we were thinking about when we were putting this, this conference together and, and thinking about the theme. So of course, as part of the conference, we have a, a wide range of panels, and we of course we very much welcome that, and this is one of the great strengths of the conference, but hopefully over the next couple of days, we'll begin the seemingly immense task of chipping away at some of these, these big questions. So if we can do that, then um, the uh, conference conveners will certainly be very happy to be ready. So, a bit of food for thought there. That's everything I wanted to say right now. What I'd like to do is hand it over um, to Shana Jafenel, who is University of Cambridge, and she's part of the DSA Council. So, just five minutes over to you, Shana. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alice. Um, I'd like to add my welcome to all of you for the annual conference. Uh, I'm a, a DSA Council member. I'm currently Treasurer of the DSA, so I'll speak for the DSA Council. Um, the DSA is the UK's learned society for all of us who are working on global development. Our institutional membership includes all major development studies institutes and centres within Europe, within the UK, as well as some within Europe. And we also have uh, over a thousand individual members, including a very large number of colleagues from the global south, and we're really delighted to have them here. We have major non-governmental organizations and publishers with strong profiles in development studies who are also institutional members. And we would like to imagine that we are an inclusive and friendly organization and that we value all our members, institutional and individual. Our annual conference is the main way in which we come together as a community. It's where we gather to advance knowledge and to think in greater depth, both about development challenges as well as future possibilities. And we are delighted this year that the conference hosted at the University of Reading uh, is going to take up themes so close to the objectives of the association. And I would like to thank particularly Alex Arnold and the local committee at Reading for organizing such a brilliant um, starting for the day. We are particularly excited about the theme of crisis in the Anthropocene, as it aligns very closely with our own commitment as an association to deepen our understanding of environmental destruction, how it's produced, sustained, and maybe overcome. This conference would have not been possible, it would not have been possible unless we had the amazing Nomad IT, Ro and their team, their administrations, and they have been the organizational force behind many of our previous annual successful conferences, and we hope they continue to do that going forward. 
We would also like to thank our sponsors, Journal of the Autumn Study, Oxford Development Study, and Journal of International Development for supporting particularly our very exciting plenary sessions. The conference has, in addition to these plenary sessions, numerous parallel sessions that you will attend over the next few days, and also innovative formats of workshops and roundtables. Furthermore, there are sessions peppered through on publication for students as well as early career researchers, discussions on the book series, the DSA OUP book series, network opportunities, and also the very important study group sessions that the DSA offers. And that what brings me to my final point. The DSA is not just a one-year event. We work on webinars, events, and activities throughout the year. And these are very much in response to what our members would like to see us do. So do join us. Sign up on the website if you haven't already become a member. Do that right now. And tell us what you want to see in activities. And thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much, um, Charlotte, and that's, that's great. Um, okay, we're going to move in now into the first plenary of the conference. But as I say, a couple of quick things, housekeeping things. First of all, I think you'll have your lanyards by now. Just a reminder, um, when you leave the conference, um, when you, you know, go home, basically, can you just remember to um, leave these? Think these are recycled, okay? These are reused, so please, please hang on to these. So please, please hand these over into reception um, before you leave at, at the end of the conference. Um, secondly, just a reminder, we do have um, a brilliant team of um, volunteers as well. So these are all students from the University of Reading. I just want to say thank you very much to them too. We couldn't do it without them. We'll recognize our volunteers, but actually we've got two at the front here. Do you want to give us a wave? They are. Um, you'll recognize them from, from their, their t shirts. Okay, so if you get lost or any questions, um, please just approach one of the volunteers. They'll be more than happy to, to try and assist you. Okay. Good. So, those things out of the way, we'll move now into the first uh, plenary session of this conference. And um, to do that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Mike Goodman. So, yeah, thank you. Can you, can you hear me in the back there? Excellent, great. Well, welcome to our first of um, three keynote sessions for the DSA. Um, I'm Mike Goodman, Professor of Human Geography from the Geography and Environmental Science Department at the University of Reading, and I'll also be chair for this session. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Jay Mystery, Professor of Environmental Geography from the Department of Geography, Royal Holloway, University of London where she's a member of the Geopolitics, Development, Security, and Justice Research Group, in addition to being the co-director of the Lieberhum Center for Wildfires, Environment, and Society, and the co-director of the COBRA Collective, which is dedicated to working with and empowering communities to engage complex sustainability challenges throughout the world. Jay's research interests include environmental management and governance, participatory visual methods, and indigenous geography. Her work involves supporting local livelihoods and biodiversity conservation, action research using participatory video and indigenous rights. She's also interested in different types of fire knowledge and how these can be brought together for more effective and socially just fire management. With just shy of 100 outlets, her work has appeared most recently in the likes of ACME, Oryx, Nature Sustainability, and Global Environmental Change. And in 2015, in recognition of her contributions for two decades of research outputs and collaboration related to conservation and policy impacts in the majority world, Jay was awarded the Royal Geographical Society's Bust Medal. Today, Jay's keynote is entitled Addressing Social and Environmental Justice Through Creating Spaces of Dialogue, and will focus on the use of collaborative research in the context of conservation and environmental governance and the need for long-term research and social commitments for sustainability and social change. And I'm going to editorialize just a little bit here. If anything, while the Anthropocene has presented us with the deepening challenges of inequality and biological crises, so too has it brought the need for radical so solidarity, communitarianism, 
and deep collaboration to the forefront of not just scholarly work, but also the ordinary and everyday social relationships that are needed for planetary survival. So Jay is going to speak for approximately 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up for discussion. And in um, you know, given that dialogue is is in the title of the talk, um, I'm going to open it up not just for a kind of call and response um, from the speaker, but also open it up to the wider audience to have much more fuller discussion around that. So without further ado, please give a very warm welcome to Professor Jay Mystery. Crises, and especially multiple crises, including climate change, global economics, war, biodiversity loss intersecting at the same time, tends to privilege those already in positions of economic, social, and political power, and emphasize behaviors towards individual interests and security while demonizing and othering those more vulnerable and marginalized. At the same time, capitalism based on economic growth, capital accumulation and increased consumption of goods and services permeates the workings of social ecological systems and solutions to the crises are many times offered in the form of market-based mechanisms or, or technocentric promises that continue to reproduce inequalities and environmental degradation. Underpinning all this is the past and arguably ongoing processes of colonialism that have appropriated, suppressed, and assimilated peoples and places, many times through acts of violence, eroding traditional knowledge, self-esteem, and the ability to equitably participate in governance and decision-making for the most marginalized in society. The theme of this conference, Crises in the Anthropocene, asks us to respond to these issues and come up with new ways of being and doing. What the concept of the Anthropocene evidences is that not only are we humans part of and impacting upon an increasingly complex global system, but that we need to criticize, reflect, and rethink our models of development and foreground diverse knowledge systems, rationality, and participation in ways that feel connections and agency between humans and non-humans, between marginalized groups, and between the marginalized and those in privileged positions who can be allies. My own journey of reflection started during my PhD research fieldwork on fire in a small protected reserve in central Brazil. I had spent a year measuring plants in the savannah and taught mostly to other researchers and the reserve managers. Numerous fires were entering the reserve from outside, and the general consensus was that, was that these were criminal fires, and that the people living around the protected area were careless and had little knowledge about how to use fire. This was within a zero fire policy context, something which I'll come back to later, a, a legacy from colonial times, where all fires were seen to be bad and taught to cause degradation to land and habitats. I couldn't accept this notion that people didn't know what they were doing. So post PhD, I went back, back to Brazil with a small branch to interview the subsistence farmers living around the reserve about their fire use. It was this initial experience that set me on a path to better understand different perspectives on how the world is, people's everyday lived realities, and to build sustained connections with specific people and places. In this lecture, I will focus on themes of ethics, equity, and justice. Using my research in the field of conservation and environmental governance, working with indigenous peoples in South America. These themes are highly shaped by my own experiences as a brown woman of working class immigrant origins, growing up in the UK and navigating higher education, both as a student and then a staff member. They are also highly influenced by my colleagues who I've collaborated with for many years, both indigenous and non-indigenous, white and non-white, European and South American. I argue that equity and justice cannot be achieved in situations where people have vastly different capabilities to participate. Many mechanisms for managing conservation and development processes 
have an implicit and perhaps naive goal to pursue consensus through activities of structured deliberation and discussion. This notion of consensus politics assumes that all members of society can participate on an equal footing and that those involved are able to recognize each other's perspectives as legitimate. However, in reality, inviting marginalized groups to take part in representative public forums is not sufficient to engender open communication due to the prevailing power dynamics that constrain their participation. Consensus politics is ultimately concerned with eliminating conflict in the form of antagonisms or opposing arguments. However, as political theorist Chantal Mouffe argues, antagonisms are fundamental and persistent and cannot be eliminated from social relations. Rather than erasing difference, Mouffe suggests that we need to accept conflict, express with tension, friction, and dissension, and enable spaces where difference does not hinder the commitment to work through and produce social outcomes. Acknowledging this agonistic pluralism has the important implication, as indicated by political philosopher Nancy Fraser, that rather than inclusive spheres of public deliber deliberation, minority or alternative perspectives are better represented by contrasting counter narratives in safe, counter, or semi public spaces. Another important issue is what the Palawa academic Maggie Walters calls the dominant 5D paradigm of indigenous data, which is also relevant more broadly to conservation and development. That is the focus of data on difference, disparity, disadvantage, dysfunction, and deprivation. As Walter says, if the priority is indigenous problems, then data interpretation will inevitably be framed in terms of indigenous deficit. In a perpetual cycle, deficit findings stimulate collection of even more deficit data and repeat. As governments and organizations are increasingly dependent on data and data analytics to inform their policies and decision making, indigenous peoples and local communities have often been the unwilling targets of policy intervention but with little say over the collection, use, and application of data about them, their lands and cultures, often trying to fix problems attributed to them, but which are not of their making, while suppressing and dis disregarding their own solutions to challenges. There is, however, a growing counter movement that recognizes how indigenous knowledge and traditional ecological knowledge more broadly can help address different types of Anthropocene emergencies. These knowledge holders appear more frequently in national and international meetings and forums, and scientific research increasingly shows how indigenous owned and managed lands have higher levels of carbon and biodiversity protection compared to protected areas managed with scientific knowledge. Yet there seems to be a fixation on what indigenous political theorist Carl Paris White calls the supplemental value of indigenous knowledge. That is, indigenous knowledge as the inputs for adding or supplementing data that scientific methods do not normally measure or track. Although indigenous peoples can benefit from these exchanges with science through improved information and research for use in their own planning processes, there is an extractive nature to these encounters that can further disempower people. There is also an assumption in this supplemental value perspective that indigenous knowledge is from the past and that once it is lost or changes, it is no longer authentic or useful. This mobilization of tradition as the category that prescribes legitimate indigeneity forces indigenous peoples to respond in essentialist ways to gain financial and political leverage. And those who do not fit are less likely to be afforded the possibility of sovereignty over their resources or selves. For example, in Brazil, Bill 490, endorsed only last month in the lower house, allows the government to reclaim land from indigenous communities whose cultural traits, inverted commas, are deemed to have changed. My own research in Guyana shows how Mapuche communities reinforce both an internal and external social memory where representations of indigenous as traditional 
and ecological guardian are aimed at the community and for future generations, but have a very clear message of self-determination to external audiences. Okay, great. So if rather than supplemental value, we focus on what calls the governance value of Indigenous knowledge, perhaps we could begin addressing the dominant deficit model of conservation and development. Here, Indigenous knowledge is the guidance for Indigenous resurgence and nation building and can help build capacity for Indigenous people to facilitate their own governance. Governance value acknowledges that Indigenous peoples continue to adapt to their changing social ecological contexts by adopting emerging means, strategies, processes, and other planning tools, including those from the non-Indigenous, and that their knowledge is dynamic and responsive. There are lessons about governance mechanisms from this knowledge for example, my research in Guyana on livelihood practices shows key governance principles that dictate indigenous lives. These include rules and regulations about particular resource extraction, the idea that consumption has an upper bound, and the importance of reciprocal relationships between people and between humans and non-humans. And, and in many cases, the ways in which Indigenous peoples and local people communities may express their views or knowledge or report their observations is in a language that is not always accessible or understandable to scientists. For example, the Kayapo people who I've worked with on Brazil, uh, worked with on fire in Brazil, use language that ascribes agency to the fire and they sing to the elements to make sure the fire acts in their favor. The following clip is from a participatory video put together by the Kaipo of the Capote Jarina Indigenous Territory in Mato Grosso, Brazil. As part of a research project I worked on, it illustrates songs encouraging spirits to have a positive effect on fires set in forest farms, and also the central role of fire in traditional ceremonies and festivals. The specific festival in the clip is the Festa de Jabuchi, or Tortoise Festival, where fire is used in communal hunts to collect tortoises, which are then brought back to the village for feasting and celebration. At the end of the clip, the elder is emphasizing their sustainable fire management and links to land and territory. I'll try to play this quick clip now. Yeah. Right. Puru kaji, puru kaji ni me puri ajuah, na me puri ajuah ni ngara ni me arif kaji torah we, na me hiri kami mori ajuah, hiri kami mori ajuah, hiri kami mori ajuah, dia kama ni ajuah, aku puru ni pen, hiri kami mori ajuah, hiri kami mori ajuah, you ya. ไม่เนี่ยแม่พูดกันอยู่ไม่ได้เลยยังวันเนี่ยแม่ก็มาเรื่องบัตรเอื้อมมาเอื้อมมาหน่อยเถอะเอาไปเนี่ยก็ไอ
Kami kau menyapi amne amu ni ayi kau mei makre lagi banyak mei mo mei ne no moga dia ku coba mereka menyorot ba mereka beli obor ami apa hong ane mei nyonya mei ku belajar ya jadi mereka apa nak bawa jauh ibu bawa 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 मैं कुछ लाइक क्या को नहीं है तो अस अस हर फ्री यू कैन सी इन दिस क्लियर इंडिजिनस पीपल्स मे बी इंबेडिंग एंड इनैक्टिंग देयर ऑब्जर्वेशंस विद इन स्टोरीज एंड सेरेमनीज and their knowledge and adaptive strategies may be encoded in their languages, cosmologies, and kinship and spiritual relationships to non-human beings and spirits. Thus, we need to rethink our approaches, our methodologies, and how diverse voices from marginalized groups can be more definitively heard, supported, and empowered in new and evolving conservation and development debates. Having laid down some of my concerns about participation and knowledge, I will now talk about the different ways my colleagues and I have attempted to help shift unequal power relations and enable indigenous the local people to surface and share their knowledge and experiences. Probably the most important in our toolkit has been participatory video and the crucial role it can play in communicating alternative stories as agonistic interventions within the context of counter hegemonic development and conservation struggle. I borrow the words from participatory video pioneer Jackie Shaw, who says participatory video can be the contextual means to build new relationships and shift social dynamics from the local level outwards, which situates it as a form of community development towards community emergence. I have suggested participatory video can structure and drive progressive community building through developing confidence and capacity, generating group purpose stimulating community deliberation to identify issues and construct solutions and rousing collective action towards improvement. Participatory video also allows people to speak in their own language and in their own ways, whether it be through direct words, stories or images, and has an expressive quality which can be effective and provocative. For example, I have facilitated the use of participatory video and video-mediated dialogue with indigenous communities in Guyana for greater inclusion of their traditional knowledge within conservation policy making and for building more transparent and accountable relationships with protected areas managers and relevant government agencies. It is widely recognized that only a small number of protected areas across the world are achieving their conservation objectives in terms of effectiveness, the impact of management on biodiversity outcomes, and equity, attention to, attention to social justice issues. The latter is particularly important, not only in terms of rights, but also because although effectiveness might be achievable in some cases with strong rule enforcement, it may be undermined or resisted and lead to conflict if people perceive unfairness, especially in the context of limited resources and diverse stakeholders. It is also important because there is increasing recognition that nature is declining less rapidly in lands owned, managed, used, or occupied by indigenous peoples, and that meaningful involvement of traditional knowledge and landholders and more equi equitable sharing of benefits can lead to better conservation outcomes. I know that's a very complicated slide, but I'm just going to summarize it. <laughs> Working within a team of Guyanese indigenous and non-indigenous researchers, firstly, we trained members of communities living in and around protected areas to use participatory video to research traditional knowledge and their relationship with protected areas. The planning, filming, editing, and screening of the videos in the community was supported by my indigenous colleagues, who after consent for sharing was obtained, edited the footage into short videos for screening to external people. The videos were shown to various decision makers, including protected areas authorities, whose responses were also captured in the video and then taken back to screening to the communities. 
Thus, we initiated a process of video-mediated dialogue between the communities and the authorities. The films made by the community and subsequent analysis of the video-mediated dialogue process allowed us to explore three aspects of equity in conservation proposed by Kate Schreckenberg and colleagues. These are recognition, procedure, and distribution. Recognition focuses on acknowledging, accepting, and respecting the legitimacy of rights, values, interests, and priorities of different actors. Procedural equity is built around decision-making and on the inclusive and effective participation of all relevant actors, and for Indigenous peoples includes free power and informed consent. <laughs> Distribution is about how costs, risks, and benefits are distributed between different actors. These elements of equity are framed by a social and political context or enabling conditions. And the principle of participatory parity underscores that recognition, procedure, and distributional justice cannot be achieved in situations where people have vastly different capabilities to participate. Our analyses found that although Indigenous peoples themselves overwhelmingly understood the role of their everyday livelihood practices, such as farming, hunting, fishing, and gathering, in sustaining biodiversity, the video-mediated dialogue process allowed protected area managers to better recognise how traditional knowledge contributed to biodiversity conservation, and how this traditional knowledge is being eroded and could be strengthened. At the same time, the video-mediated dialogue allowed Indigenous peoples themselves to reflect on their own positive and negative practices and impacts on biodiversity and look for ways in which their traditional knowledge could be supported and strengthened. Issues of procedural and distributional equity surfaced in the participatory videos and the video-mediated dialogue gave Indigenous communities the opportunity to challenge protected area authorities on several issues including the day-to-day -day running of the protected area, limited Indigenous leadership positions, wider governance of the protected area, and benefit sharing from tourism and other activities. In response, protected area managers were able to better understand local issues and priorities, and action and address, misunder address mis misunderstandings on specific claims. Thus, in an antagonistic situation, the video-mediated dialogue process did not suppress dissent, but provided a structured and safe place through which conflicting perspectives could be surfaced and exchanged so that both sides could begin to understand the other. As a process, we have found that participatory video allows for a progressive building of capacities, confidence, and dialogue in different spaces. At the start, individuals and the group doing the participatory video have a safe space in which they can develop their skills and knowledge and also begin to critically reflect on this knowledge. As the process moves to the community level, it deepens contextual understanding through wider reflection and sense-making, identifying community issues as well as community and solutions. This internal space and dialogue are critical to start a collective agency or purpose before showing the films to external people. Outside the community, the video mediates external dialogue by enabling the audiences to see, hear, and feel, and helps to reposition people in this external space. I'd like to exemplify the progressive dialogue process in the following quotes from videos from the North Rupin Union Indigenous Community, their representative organization, the North Rupin Union District Development Board, or the NRDDB, and the protected area with which they are associated, the Iroquois Forest. In the community videos, there are multiple references to the deteriorated relationship between the North Rupin Union Indigenous Communities and the Irukama International Centre to manage the protected area, such as, I don't know what is happening at the present management, not much interaction at this time like before, kind of slow, no regular information sharing. This was also highlighted by the North Rupin Union District Development Board members in their video. Right now, there is not much involvement within the board at Irukrama. Like the relationship or the partnership get boring. Like when you're married to a man and the man don't want to see you no more. That is how Irukrama and the NRDDB is today. 
However, viewing the community and their own videos, there was also a recognition of their own role by the NIDDB. Like I said before, we have become complacent, so it's not only on Irohama's part, we also have to take some responsibility. These two comments were, are then directly addressed in the Irokrama response video. I think X is right. We need to inject some more love and update this relationship, but it's also a two-way street. I think Irokrama takes a lot of responsibility and there is a lot of expectation for Irokrama to go out and say, this is what we are doing and to share. But I think X said it as well. NIDDB also needs to hold up their end of the deal. So consultation and relationship is two-way. So I think that needs to be strengthened. When the Irokama response video was then screened back to the Rupin Union Indigenous communities, people acknowledge more strongly that there is a two-way relationship between the protected area and the community, and that both sides need to take responsibility. Like, Ms. like Mr. X of NRDDB said, it is not Irokama alone that we should blame, but some of the blame falls on our community too. So as much as we are calling on Irokrama to rejuvenate all these activities, I think some of those is still with us, and I would say 75% is with us. This specific example of the video mediated dialogue process highlights how participatory video can engender a respect for diversity between adversaries or different perspectives. Nevertheless, Participatory, is not with, participatory video is not without its challenges, including how to move participants beyond superficial discussions and reframe their experiences more critically, and navigating between fostering collective agency and recognizing individual difference. In the video mediated dialogue process, there has also been the tension between building awareness as a basis for collaboration with external allies and provoking these audiences to think critically by bringing challenging views and interpretations of reality into wider political spaces. For example, in Guyana, in the same, in the same example, a protected area manager became very defensive of his actions rather than respond in a constructive way to feedback from indigenous groups on how to improve relations between them and the authorities. These tensions all point to what Jackie Shaw calls an extended process of participatory video that requires considerable time and facilitation input to enable participants' agendas to emerge and meaningful change to happen. <clears throat> All of my work in the last 15 years, especially in the use of participatory video, has involved peer researchers. These have been Indigenous community members who, who over time have built their skills and experience of doing research in their own communities. Peer researchers have also been the facilitators of peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchanges, spaces where people from similar social, economic, and or cultural backgrounds can share their knowledge and experiences on common issues. For example, with colleagues, we have facilitated exchanges between different indigenous communities in Guyana and across the Guyana Shield region of South America on traditional knowledge and livelihood practices. More recently in Guyana, we have been organizing exchanges on indigenous crafting. The staple food cassava and its many byproducts are intimately linked to indigenous craft objects used for its harvesting, processing, and cooking. An underlying issue to the exchanges has been a disconnect and disillusionment between older and younger generations surrounding traditional knowledge transmission. Older people lament the disinterest and distractions of young people and young people complain that older people don't want to share their knowledge with them. In this context, peer researchers have been key to the process of self-reflection within individuals and communities, promoting respect for divergent views, for example, between elders and youth, yet also enabling positive change in the narrative towards pride, solution focus, and cooperation. For the people participating in the exchanges, the fact that people from the community are carrying out the, the research gives them confidence and trust in the process. That the peer researchers come from the local communities is in itself a demonstration that solutions to community problems could already be present within the community. A move away from the deficit model of development exemplified by an external researcher undertaking research on Indigenous communities. 
So in the following very short clip, um, I want to show you members from Indigenous communities in Guyana talking about their peer exchange experiences. Well, I think having community exchange uh, is a very good idea because you, you learn from each other. And sometimes you don't know if you would be in level terms with the, the place you have the exchange with, or you below them or you are above them. So getting information from, from portions from different areas will allow you to know how far you are in your development status as well as it can you can help contribute to their development what was really interesting in this workshop or session was that our facilitators were local resource persons that we feel free and comfortable in interacting in our own language communicating with others and sharing our ideas, this, this is what I learned during the period. Friends coming from Apteri, they learn a lot, I know, they learn a lot about this, how to do farming. And also I see that um, when I see their video for the um, COS, right, community owner, solution that they have, mm -hmm. I see that is very important as well. I see I learned something from them too, right, as a hunter, right. So we, we, it's very important by exchanging the, uh, this is how we can exchange our traditional way. People from another village might come now here and share their traditional knowledge and we can share it to them as well. So that, 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 that the thing that I look at more exchange of workshops and meetings like how we have the after people maybe more people should come so that we can have or listen to their views and maybe we can see the differences between among ourselves then a follow-up of what has taken place here in the last few days I think if it should be continued in terms of community exchange, um, it, again, it's another step forward with having our friends all the way from South coming here. It makes you feel stronger. It builds a stronger relationship with, with other communities. I think um, having a follow-up of what has taken place here would be of great use for community. Oh, you've got people. Okay, yeah. okay great. We even got some tropical birds in there as well. Okay. Um so I was talking about peer researchers. Um at the same at the same time, there are inherent tensions for peer researchers trying to navigate research on the ground within their communities. Evaluating the process has shown that although there are benefits of gaining access and logistical help for the research, there are complex issues of trust, relationship and positionality in relation to other community members, mean that peer researchers have to confront frequent comments, criticisms and jealousies. Overall, however, peer researchers have been a powerful conduit for authentic Indigenous voices and for enabling and opening the spaces of peer exchange the places for being with and listening to each other and for learning and experimentation. 
They have been critical in providing the translation link between the language and storytelling communicative articulations of their own communities and the comprehension and, and interpretation of the data collected for external audiences. So nowhere is a respect for diversity between adversaries needed than in the topic of fire. As I mentioned before, zero fire has been the dominant policy in many fire prone and fire adapted ecosystems, such as tropical savannas. Fire suppression and firefighting have been the, the dominant approaches to managing fire, although the exclusion of fire actually promotes fires of greater intensity and extension due to the accumulation of combustible material. This situation is being exacerbated by climate change and social, cultural and demographic dynamics, extending the periods and spaces of fire occurrence as we see in escalating catastrophic wildfire events across the world. Indigenous peoples and local communities use fire for subsistence activities, such as Sweden agriculture, hunting and gathering, as well as to control the spread of wildfire. However, the exclusion of Indigenous and local communities from decision making on fire management and governance has caused distrust, and historical conflicts have prevented the generation of new approaches and joint agreements to the problem. In this context, my Venezuelan colleague Viviana Bilbao and I have organized and facilitated intercultural workshops, spaces of encounter to air perspectives, experiences, and historical and modern worldviews about fire, and to find ways to take action. Separately, Viviana and I have worked in Venezuela and Brazil Guyana, respectively, for many years, so I have a deep understanding of the historical and contemporary political, social, and economic context surrounding fire, as well as long-term links with specific indigenous communities. Our first intercultural workshop took place in Venezuela over four days, bringing together 60 people from environmental agencies, conservation government institutions, firefighters, academics, and indigenous peoples from Venezuela, Brazil, and Guyana. Old enemies were present, as were new allies. For example, from Brazil, there was representation from IBAMA, the environmental government agency that maintained and policed the Zero Fire Policy. And from Venezuela, in Parques, the National Parks Authority that banned fire in lands used by indigenous peoples. In the same space, we had indigenous group representatives who, despite coming from different social political contexts, formed comradeship over similar experiences with authorities, and firefighters that were champions of indigenous cultural burning. As with many intercultural settings, this one involved complex legacies of injustice and layers of historically constructed power relations and patterns of disadvantage and advantage deeply entrenched in social, political, and economic realities on the ground. In this intercultural workshop then, we aim to address the intercultural capacity deficits of dominant institutions, processes and knowledge systems. And to quote geographer Richard Howard, promote a shift towards new ethical competencies that acknowledge the different values, understanding and priorities that exist, and the ability to respect and work with people whose worldviews are not just different, but contrary to one own. Using a series of participatory activities and with an eye on the interface between different groups and individuals, we work through a learning heuristic divided into overlapping and iterative stages where we explore the context and connections, formulated systems of interest, identified feasible and desirable changes, and developed ways to take action. The activity started with participants working in their peer groups to have an open, unstructured exploration of the situation and to build trust and confidence and to create space, safe spaces for discussion and to then gradually narrow down the topics and work by country to identify possible practical interventions. The evidence and experiences shared at the meeting allowed the dominant institution to acknowledge the importance and value of fire for ecosystems culture and survival, 
and to accept alternative approaches and perceptions about fire, such as fire as friend, fire as a tool, responsible and holistic use of fire, in contrast to fire as enemy and combat suppress exclude fire. Working at this intercultural interface also produced a collective acknowledgement of the value of traditional indigenous understandings of fire for the long-term sustainability of ecosystems. And to begin thinking of ways to integrate and transcend different ways of knowing and understanding fire behavior and its impacts, particularly in light of the effects of climate change. Nevertheless, there was a tension felt more acutely at subsequent workshops of how indigenous and local fire knowledges would be included in policies and action. For example, a number of countries across the world, including Brazil, have begun climate change mitigation programs based on indigenous cultural burning. These aim to reduce wildfires and associated greenhouse gases through a focus on early dry season burning, prescribed burning. However, inherent in the nature of these institutionalized management programs is to de-link fire from li livelihood practices, practices which happen all the year round, and to replace the complexity and contingency of indigenous fire management with standardized goals and practices. Although our intercultural workshops have been spaces of active listening and dialogue, and the recognition and legitimization of indigenous knowledge, with a growing number of fire carbon offsetting schemes, including the United Nations Reduced Emissions from Deforestation and Degradation, Red Plus, we have had the challenge of a general focus of implementing agencies on the supplemental value of Indigenous fire knowledge, namely how Indigenous fire knowledge can inform and aid institutional and non-Indigenous objectives. And there is a defensive, angry, and confused response by those in charge of these schemes to any critique or comments of carbon colonialism, as they see this work as beneficial to indigenous communities, a step up from how it used to be under the zero fire regime. Many indigenous peoples are also not against these schemes, as they bring in short to medium term resources and contribute to livelihoods through paid work, for example, as rangers. Intercultural workshops have therefore been an interesting and many times difficult interplay of power dynamics, aspirations, local realities, and my own academic biases against the greenwashing practice of carbon offsetting. However, there have also been spaces of experimentation where individuals, practices, and relationships have been actively cultivated and the governance value of indigenous knowledge constantly affirmed. I like this quote by Australian geographer Tim Neal, in the context of fire management collaborations between Aboriginal communities and Australian institutions, when he says, what is occurring is not decolonization in the sense of a complete and irreversible transfer of authority or withdrawal of settler colonial government, but rather the iterative decolonizing renovation of the political and practical dominance of settler agency. These are modest but real gains with nascent and unpredictable effects on those involved. Slowly, resources and authority are less solely on the side of the government and its agencies. Here, we arrive at a synthetic understanding of the decolonial and the experimental. A decolonizing experiment is one that allows for the emergence of questions that could not be asked before, because indigenous people are leading the management of their country. Such experiments materially alter ecologies, the political and economic position of indigenous peoples, and give rise to new ideas about possible futures and new debates about how country might be cared for differently. To conclude then, participatory video, peer research and exchange, and intercultural workshops all contribute to developing more relational and nuanced understandings of conservation and development, while building knowledge and agency. Returning to the Anthropocene, crisis can be a time of experimentation, as indicated by Mike Goodman and colleagues in their work on sustainability transitions and transformation. 
A crisis enables the cracks to appear in the dominant neoliberal governance model, allowing dissenting and conflicting voices to emerge. If we enable mechanisms for this dissent to be heard and honoured, it can allow for the emergence of new forms of progressive and radical solidarity practices and policies. As researchers, we could better align our approaches to ethics and equity, envisage our collaborations with the people we work with as walking together, to steal the phrase from Tim Neal, and enact our projects as messy experiments riddled with conflict that take time and our iterative cycles of doing and reflecting that don't necessarily have clear spatial and temporal boundaries. In my own case, I have committed to working with the same places and people for a number of decades. And although it comes with numerous entanglements and funding challenges, it also comes with a sense of purpose, allyship and care that keeps me motivated going forward. Crucially, the satisfaction of my work emerges in seeing marginalized communities grow in agency and determining their own futures. Thank you. Well, that was brilliant. Thank you so much, Dave. So we're going to open it up for some questions. Um, we'll take them individually, and then we'll also open up for discussion if there's any responses to those questions, as well as what Jenny is saying. So, there's, I think, some questions from the online chat oh, as well. Okay. Do you want to just wait, in case, wait yeah. to collate those, and then yes. and we can go backwards and forth? Of course, yes. yes. No, that's just. No, I thought there was one coming in, but maybe I'm wrong. Oh, there is one being typed up. <laughs> okay, great. So All right. maybe maybe I'll take share of privilege and start us off. Yeah. Um, when you were oh, here's a question here. Great. Okay. <laughs> so we've got a microphone now. Go ahead. And um, as you ask your question, please uh, say who you are and um, a little bit about yourself, where you're from, etc. Um, thank you very much. It's Phil uh, Papiano from the uh, Open University. I work in the area of uh, relational justice. Uh, we focus on development and technological innovation. Thanks very much for your presentation. Um, you mentioned that um, using participatory uh, video revealed those different aspects of equity. One uh, was recognition, the other was uh, procedural equity, the other was uh, distributed uh, equity. I wonder whether any of these aspects um, was sort of prioritized or all of them came together with equal weight in, in their responses to your steps. Thank you. Thank you for that question. It's a really great question. Um, I would say recognition was definitely the first one in terms of priorities, because I think it's something that um, just kind of like it, it, it goes back to the idea of like just being able to understand someone else's worldview and interests and and I think that was definitely the one that were came up a lot in all of the videos very very strongly. I think the other ones are also there, um, but you know if you had to put them in a hierarchy, as you said, which one it would be recognition first and then the distribution and procedural ones were kind of coming out afterwards. And maybe maybe there's a level of you know once that recognition. Uh, equity aspect is kind of not addressed, but you know, at least we're doing something about it, then those things would be, uh, move higher up basically in priority for people. But yeah, recognition was definitely something. I think a lot of the communities that I work with have had so much, uh, has, yeah, there's, you know, centuries of oppression and and issues with violence, etc., and non recognition, but that is something that's very, very important. Great. So we're we're warming up. We've we've got a question online. Let's take that one. So um, I work as director of programs with Insight Share, specialized in participatory. Oh, there it goes. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Let me do that. That one was came in first. So that's probably. And so, maybe it's worth read. Should, should I, I'm happy to read that off. Or yeah. 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 So Dr. Mitri, at what level do you see the greatest impact of your research at challenging understanding between stakeholders? At changing local institutions or challenging many times racist 
and colonial policies in the country he's been working. Depends on the answer. That's it. Ah, there's just an extra comment. From our online Argentine. Yes, yes, there's an online Argentine. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah I think it's um I don't know. I don't know which one is the I don't know. I think it's both. I can't really say which one is the kind of the most. I think both of those are really, really have been really difficult uh issues in terms of like stakeholders and then also kind of like challenging the kind of policies um i think you know i would say maybe the the first one is probably the, the, the thing that i've worked with in my is firstly working with the stakeholders and then kind of moving through the policies i think it's through changing people's ideas and worldviews and trying to get them to understand other people worldviews and ideas and perspectives is for me has been in my case anyway the first step i think in terms of thinking about how do you then how do you then take actions and then how do you change policy so i probably yeah those both of those two things are really important but i'd probably be the first one in terms of stakeholders would be the most important uh, I just have a follow up with that. So, thinking about the, the role of the, uh, the videos, yeah. um, have you been able to use or have you used those in such a way that they've been a record of people's understandings of themselves or communities to speak to, say, state power or to use them in such a way that allows the community to resist whatever's happening and whatever the, the context is? So, kind of building off of that, and, and have they? In a practical sense, have they been used in such a way to empower those communities to, you know, outside of of those communities, um, just in particular the state? Yeah, uh, and I, I think actually a lot of that work hasn't necessarily been like through my research, but it's it's been because through the peer researchers who have been training to participate in video, they continue to do research in their own communities, and when things come up, they will do that. So, for example, during the pandemic um they were there was a lot of issues going on during the pandemic because they're quite isolated communities they were kind of left on their own they had very little help in terms of what they could you know resources given to them during the pandemic and there was through the participation video they just started making videos of their own about challenging the state on what was going on in terms of like you know why is there no help coming here you know it's a way of communicating to people outside the community but that, that a lot of that i feel is great because it's actually not necessarily me or a researcher a research program doing that but they've actually taken the methodology and the tool and, and the ability and capacity to do the research and so they've just gone on and done it themselves yeah okay, thank you there's a question up there okay, thank you very much for the presentation oh, I'm Natalie Fischfeld, and I'm a research fellow being at the University of the West Indies in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And um, I really appreciated seeing Indigenous people from Guyana, which is considered a small and undeveloping state, even though it's such a large country. Um, so I have two questions kind of related to field work and methodology. Mm -hmm. You had purpose your talk um, with identity and saying what it means to be a brown person doing research. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering how that impacted your access in the field, and did you get access to these communities through the state, or through previous contacts based on the other field work that you did in Brazil? And then maybe a little bit more about the communities, which um, I wasn't sure which part of Guyana mm -hmm. um, you were placed in, because it such a huge country with contiguous borders with Venezuela and Brazil. So where is this community if they're able to see me? Just a little bit more. Okay, great. Um, so um, I've worked with various communities across Guyana, um, but the place where I've done most research um, for a very long time has been in the Rukunini, which is um, the southwest of Guyana, and it borders with Brazil. Um, and a lot of the communities there, but it's, it's quite, um, how would you say, um, you know, a lot of the communities are very mobile in that previous to, 
previous to you know states dividing up land basically those communities were all one big nation so there's the Wakatana and the Makuchi nation and it was just like you know the borders being put in so a lot of them move across from Brazil to Venezuela, Venezuela to Guyana, Guyana to Brazil. They have family and friends and everything. So it's a kind of mobile kind of like flux kind of landscape in terms of movement of people. So that's the kind of place, that's the place where I've worked with for a long time. And actually when I started working there initially, um, it wasn't really very much based around participation in the sense of how I'm working now, because it was it was a very kind of like what the project I started working there on was about water monitoring. It was about looking at mercury pollution in the rivers due to mining, because mining is a, a really big thing uh, in a lot of parts of the Amazon, including that part. And so I was kind of like part of the team that went there to look at the impacts of mining and on the on the fish populations, particularly because they rely heavily on fish for their food. Um, but it was yeah, it was through that process of that initial visit that. Um, I just kind of started developing relationships with people and then continued to go back to the same place to keep working there. So, yeah, that's the place that I'm working. And then in terms of thinking about myself, I think, you know, um, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that um, being a brown woman academic has given me necessarily more um, access to communities or anything like that. I think it's um I suppose I come with a kind of my own experiences kind of shape maybe the way that I approach things. Um, you know, my own experiences of racism, both as a child growing up in the UK and as a teenager, but also within higher education, um, I think probably shaped the way maybe I just approach the situation. I always see myself as having power in those situations. I you know, there is a power dynamic there. In terms of you know my positionality as a foreign researcher, someone who comes with resources um, and has different type of knowledge. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think you. I would, it would be interesting to ask some of my colleagues there and some of the community members of their perspective on it. But um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Great. So I'm, I'm seeing four questions here lined up. Um, and we're going to try a second microphone. So we've got one, there was another one up here, one there, and then back here. And then we'll raise our hands as a group again, and I'll, I'll count so to get people going. Go ahead. So there's very kind of for me to do this button. It's, it's right. not working, Tara. So maybe just stand up and speak out. Try it. All right, we'll just. Make these guys run around the room a little bit more. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Terry Cannon, Emeritus Fellow from the Institute of Development Studies. Um, thanks for a very clear um, uh, description of the work we've been doing, uh, which is, is excellent. I think it's fortunate uh, we can say that there are many other initiatives which are very similar. And, and the point I want to make is actually maybe for a more general discussion is how how DSA can act and we can have to take it from this micro level to more strategic thinking. Mm -hmm. So in, in my thinking, and you talked about the change of the constitution um, in, in Brazil, which I saw a couple of weeks ago and I found absolutely shocking, where the indigenous peoples are being asked give over land rights to the invading forces that the settler colonialists. And this is happening under um, uh, Lula, not Bolsonaro. Um, and it reminds me of a, a couple of years ago, a report came out called Bankrolling Extinction. And this report, which was highlighted in, in The Guardian and other places, reported that the 50 top financial institutions in the world, including Citibank, uh, JP Morgan, and so on, they had bankrolled uh, to the tune of $2.6 trillion investments which were going to be damaging to the environment, mining, deforestation, and so on. Now, our, our pathetic little funding we get for research, or even what NGOs get for development projects, is um, uh, I worked it out roughly, it's a thousand times less than that. So I call this the, the damage to fuel ratio. How much? is being invested in causing the damage, 
and what pathetic little sums of money do we get to cure the damage? And I, we have to have a bit more strategic thinking about this because, um, uh, and I'm, I'm not wishing to demean this work because I do this kind of work as well. It, it, it always feels good and it, uh, we see changes happening at the local level. But overall, you've got much more powerful forces which are creating far more damage than we can ever fix with what we get. And I want to open that up from your excellent examples to see how the essay can foster um, a, a, a strategic thinking on this damage to pure ratio idea. Mm -hmm. Maybe I just I just come on very quickly to that. I think um, what you're saying is true. Um, I suppose one of the things that you know, despite working on the local level, um, you know, the, using the video mediated dialogue process, in my experience anyway, has opened up conversations with the national government because that's that's what we were doing. We were talking to ministries, so using the video as a way to mediate conversations between local communities and the government. Um, and different government agencies. And in some cases, I think, you know, that, so so it is happening at a slightly larger scale in terms of doing that. It's not obviously those organizations that are doing the damaging work, but like in Venezuela, for example, we have made a lot of progress in terms of the government thinking about fire management and how that, how we should institute these policies. So it has actually affected the kind of policy level. Obviously it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, address what you're saying about different kinds of organizations and companies that are doing that kind of damaging work. But um, it has opened up conversations that not it's not just about the local, but we are working actually at the regional and the national level as well in using those methodologies. Hi. Hello. Um, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Um, I'm Anthony Sasa from IIT Bangladesh in India. Um, I, I work with the Adivasis and the in indigenous communities in India, and um, one of the challenges that we often see, like at least I have faced, I feel that how do you, and it somehow it um, came up in, in your presentation as well. So, my question would be that what are the challenges that you face or um, the communities face while transmitting their traditional knowledge to the state authorities, and how do they negotiate that? You know. There are barriers of language, culture, colonialism. There are so many barriers which 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 have to So, if if in order to get their point across to, to the state authorities and the colonial and, and the colonial agencies, um, what would be the challenges if you could uh, shed some light on it, and then how can they over overcome that? Mm -hmm. Um, I would say that you know there are lots of different challenges, and we can't got can't get through all of them. But I think one of the things that, in my experience, has been an issue is having enough time. So, you know, like I said in this talk, a lot of those uh, conflicts that you have between local communities, indigenous peoples, and government, um, there's lots of layers behind that. And it takes a lot of time to peel those layers away. And so, the kind of work that I've been doing has taken a long time and it involves. Uh, Spending a lot of time doing this, you know, doing the participatory video. So that kind of iteration between communities making videos, then being then showed to government agencies, government agencies making a response that is then showed back to communities. That is not just a one cycle, that's like a one of many cycles of then using that as a, in an iterative way and building relationships and building that transparency process over time. So I think. Yeah, as a short answer to that very, very difficult question, maybe we can talk about it later, uh, one to one, um, is that I think we need to spend more time doing the kind of work that we do, especially if we really want to make a change and we want to try to address some of those historical and even contemporary conflicts that are going on. It doesn't, you can't do that in just one off conversations between indigenous people and government. Yeah. Good question. On this side, there was somebody had their hand up. There he is. Thanks. Uh, Mark Pepper from the School of International Development at the University of East Anglia. Thanks for a great presentation. I very much enjoyed it. I'd like to pick up on your um, 
just the, the reference you made to the peer researchers about some of the difficulties that you found, I, I guess, or that they experienced having been selected as peer researchers. It's an approach that, that I also use in my, in my research. And I find, you know, in trying to identify suitable people, to me seems to be fraught with difficulty and that you want to be very egalitarian in, in how you identify your peer researchers, but almost inevitably, uh, I feel you tend to default to people that already have some level of skill or some level of education. So in that sense, it's not a very egalitarian process when you look at, say, intra-community differences. So just your reflections on how you've navigated some of those issues perhaps. Yeah. That's, with, that's totally the case in the work that I've done too. And I suppose the first time we, the first time we've been working for, so when we kind of go to go to the indigenous communities, we, we've got to kind of work through their systems of governance, right? In terms of how you approach and how you, you kind of talk about the work you're going to do. And a lot of it will go through the two shells, the institute and the village, uh, who kind of makes the decisions. And you know, we can ask, yes, we would like to have six ladies and six you know, women and six men from the communities, you know, blah, blah, blah. and then next thing you know, you get like uh, 12 people who turn up who are completely like different because the, the two shout has chosen some of them, and the half of them are relatives of the two shout, basically. Um, and so that is that is a common occurrence, but I think what we've done is tried to kind of work through that. Because we've had we've had to do it that way because we've had to work through the systems of governance that are in those communities. But then to then work through those people to then identify other people in the community that can come on board to do the to help do the research. So I think it's been a kind of like that kind of snow doing a bit of a snowballing thing where you know initially we know that this is how things are going to happen. And then using those peer, those that first set of groups, some people fall out, so then you get a little core group of people, and then using those people to then identify other people that maybe the two shall or you know don't belong to the most important families in the community, etc., to then kind of come on board. So that's the way we kind of built a network of peer researchers in the, in the community. But yeah. It's hard work, it's not easy, it's not easy. And um, maybe it looks sound like it was, you know, what I'm giving you a very short talk about it, that's why, but yeah, it's really complex. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, my name is Catherine Brashman and I'm a researcher in the Reach Water Program at the University of Oxford. And I've done a little bit of work um, with participatory photography in the past. And what I found is a, a myriad of ethical issues that are specifically related to using visual methods in terms of ownership after the project, who owns those videos, um, the way that people are represented in those videos, and then also the key implications that there are in that for obtaining free, free prior and informed consent. And I wonder if you wouldn't mind talking a bit about how your project engaged with these ethical issues specifically for visual methods and what you found perhaps was one or two of the most stickiest um, ethical issues that you encountered. Well, thanks very much. Yeah. Um, so in terms of kind of the way to address the ethical and the ethical issues, I suppose one of the things that we uh, the first thing that we have done is that for example we developed uh, our own consent process at the local level in in discussion with the communities and the the two chairs, the, the chief of community. So that so we had to sit we sat down with them. I mean we did the okay I'm in the university so I don't know if I should say that we, we did the university ethical process and then parallel you know we did a, a, an ethical process in the community that was more relevant to them which were going through the project, spending a lot of time discussing what the project was going to do on how visual methods were going to be used, uh, giving them a lot of opportunity in the, and also translation in their own language as well to discuss you know, what are some of the issues and going on. And then to come up with a kind of what they call, they like to call the traffic lights, even though there are no traffic lights where they live. But I think they're thinking about when they go to the capital, there are traffic lights there. The traffic light system of like red, yellow, and green of what they want to share, basically. So they would say, okay, this is red, not leaving this community. 
yellow, we're going to have to talk to lots of people and then come up with an agreement. And green, that's fine. We're happy to share this outside the community. So we kind of, because of the, like you said, the nature of digital materials, um, that was the way we did it. We did it in a way where we developed a kind of consent process in the community that was really led by them to kind of think about what it was that they wanted to kind of talk about. And obviously, in terms of ownership of the material, um, ownership is, in my case, in my research, has always been with them. They own the material and they give me the rights to use that material in my research um, in terms of the raw footage and also the final films. And a lot of the final films they make are, is not the necessarily the data that I use to do my research. So the data might be based, the data is based on the raw footage that they give me access to. Um, and then the films, the final participation films that they produce for sharing has all the, has, followed, has passed the green light basically process of within their own community of doing that. So I don't, that's my short answer to that. I don't know if that's okay. Is that right? Hello. Hello. I'm Sonia Diaz. Yes, I am the resident of all of this at Weibo, Women in Informal Employment Globalizing Organizing. And I really loved your presentation. I've been doing work for maybe four decades with great speakers in my country, Brazil, where using participatory methodologies, but fundamentally drawing from Paulo Freire's uh, popular education. And we work a lot with art and theater as a uh, means to mobilize and uh, also do awareness raising and a lot of uh, of, of these uh, methods that you have mentioned and uh, i was uh, you know uh, kind of you know the, the, the comment from uh, ethnography professor terry yeah you know, about what is happening in my country, Brazil, we have a government, you know, Lula as a government, but we have one of the worst sounds of fighting in the world, you know, predominantly fundamentalist, far right, uh, far, uh, far, uh, members of parliament, and coupled with uh, the power of cooperation, you know, uh, Things are really, really hard, not only in the area related to the indigenous peoples of Brazil and the Amazonia and other parts of Brazil where we have indigenous peoples, but about other uh, key areas where we have made a uh, strong uh, move towards inclusivity, which includes my area, solid waste uh, management. We I have one of the most progressive uh, in terms of inclusion of uh, waste pickers, uh, legislation and policy. And what we see is most of the things that we had achieved in the past that now Lula is kind of uh, going back to reviewing and, and drawing from his uh, progressive policies are then uh, it finds, you know, it's uh, um, the Congress and our uh, uh, House of Parliament is really destroying everything. So I think there is something for us that is, is this called how can we, you know, <laughs> uh, internationally build some solidarity and ways to support the communities that we work with, be it indigenous peoples the uh, work, the formal workers like way speakers, you know, to stay on my example. The other thing that I want to mention is that I really like that uh, comment about um, ethics, and I like your <laughs> your comment about the traffic lights because uh, that's all right. Because we have something about that. I've been working with uh, way speakers for ages, and because I um something that Grouchy would call it the organic intellectual because I'm part of the movement of way speakers, the national movement of way speakers that I supported to create and um, that I have this very close relationship all over with us is really built by kind of ethical consensus that is really um uh, uh, drafted within this community, with the national movement of waste pickers. And they are far more important than the 
theatrical uh, committees at the university, although I support them. And I think it's about really engaging with these communities to see, uh, to engage them from the very beginning and work out what is ethical. So it's just a call to for that. For that. Thank you. Great. So we've got a question down there. I want to see us two more because um, we're getting close towards the end. So. Second, and then the final question here. You doing okay up there? You're out of water. I'm not good at <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I really enjoyed this talk today. Thank you. Um, I'm Penny Osborne, I'm Professor of International Development here at Reading. So we also have interpreting these types of, of methodologies and uh, the, you know the, the benefits and challenges that come with them through work with DPA or participatory photography and visual um, work that I've done with colleagues in the Philippines or more ongoing in terms of natural farming innovations in India, for example. Um, and one of the challenges that we often you know are facing is is how you support people to continue to create their messages and what those will look like. You mentioned that you've been um, very successful and you've been able to work for a long period of time with communities um, and that they have actually been able to take forward those types of uh, methods themselves to create voice and, and resistance. Um, so I was, my first question was uh, really to maybe follow up on how you see them taking forward those messages, who curates the right message um, and whether they are also looking beyond the types of um, communication and channels and formats that you've provided and perhaps maybe with younger people looking into other forms that we, we see marginalized people using like social media for example. So that was my, my first question and perhaps coming back to the important aspect of strategic um, transformation and, and how you build a stronger resistance against some of you know the, the wider collective agency. So you've had a sort of a number of communities um, and you've connected some of those communities. So my second question really was around how you network and support and somebody just mentioned about social movement. Um, so it was really about the opportunities that might come in terms of connecting those voices to become more powerful, perhaps to, to challenge some of the, um, you know, the, the difficult ways that they've seen the fire management, for example, being institutionalized. Um, so it's my two questions. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to go for the first one, uh, the second one, sorry, first, because I just remember what you said, you're going to have to go back and think about what the first one was. Um, yeah. Um, so one of the things that I have been trying to do a lot in terms of my fire management work is definitely doing that kind of connection between between the different uh, between different indigenous groups in different parts of the northern part of South America, basically where I've found most of my work, and and it has been very important in terms of those so those intercultural workshops. Um, some of them have been actually in the country, like one country, and then bring lots of people together. But others have been like the one I just explained, like bringing three countries together. So that you can bring those voices together and then kind of put those voices out. And I suppose one of the things that I do definitely want to do more of is like then going across to other, you know, other things. So like, for example, we through the wildfires, the Indian Wildfire Centre, which I helped to co-direct, you know, we have communities in different, like in Australia, also in North America, um, different communities that are at, in different kinds of context of indigenous or cultural fire management in some cases people are doing it like and they've still got the the knowledge in other cases they've lost the knowledge completely in other cases they've lost the knowledge but they're trying to re regain that knowledge um, and trying to research you know do resurgence of that information and trying to kind of bring all those people together and then kind of put that those messages out so that's definitely something which i think is really important and something on my pipeline of things to do I kind of started it, but maybe on a smaller scale, and then thinking about more globally of how to do that. I'm trying to remember what your first question was. Remind me, just give me a key word, and it's going to come to me. How people themselves curating okay. new messages or other yeah, 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 yeah. So, 
Yeah, that's that, that's a really, really interesting topic and a piece of research that I've probably got a PhD student to do or something because it would be so super interesting. It's something that I haven't had time to follow up. But as I said to you, like during COVID, um, you know, I like all of my research, everybody's research project came to a standstill basically, but everybody was still communicating on social media. And so we were still having these kind of communications and finding out what people were doing and stuff like that. So they were putting messages out there. They were using the participatory video, like I said, to kind of film what was going on or not going on in terms of government support and trying to get those messages out. And the kind of platforms they, they do use different kinds of platforms, like Facebook, for example, is a big thing, you know, for indigenous groups in South America. So everybody, a lot of indigenous people would be on Facebook. So they would then put those messages out on Facebook. So they're definitely using those things in new ways. But I would also love to know more about that curation and you know who who's putting them out there sometimes it's not always super clear whether it's an individual or whether it's actually a group or it's actually the community or who's doing it so yeah i, I can't answer that question but i think it's a really interesting piece of work that could be done about trying to follow up and trying to see how those tools have been taken forward by people and, and who does that work in the back in the background kind of thing. So, yeah Great. So for our next few, we've got five minutes left. Our next few questions, if we can make them relatively quick, that would be great. Um, so we make sure that we're, we're out on time as well. Great. Excellent. Go ahead, Jeff. Thank you, James Christopher, from the University of Bath. You left us hanging a bit with the initial story about fire. So where did you end up? Because um, you said you wanted to find out whether the um, the local use of fire was irresponsible and that your colleagues in the um, conservation world misunderstanding them and where do you end up in terms of um, uh, your judgments about that and given the fact that these things aren't static yeah um so i actually so i did that piece of work with those small farmers around the reserve and really uh it gave me a really really interesting understanding of how they were making decisions about fire and how different kinds of climatic and economic uh factors were playing into why they were burning and when and how they were doing that and then as part of that i just i just continue a little bit and then as part of that um they were telling me things about how they were using the moon and the lunar cycle in terms of how when they were going to do their burning and stuff like that and i thought oh that's really interesting i know something about indigenous people doing that as well and that kind of just took me into the and that's how i ended up working with indigenous communities on on fire it was initially through that work with small farmers of so farmers and understanding all the reasons why and how they were burning and then kind of reading around that and then thinking okay maybe I, I, it would be great to go and talk to some indigenous people and see how they're burning and how how does that how does that com compare contrast to the way subsistence farmers doing it and that's kind of how i got into working with indigenous groups in brazil working on fire and then later on in guyana and in venezuela yeah. Hello, my name is Aisha, and I'm from Punjab, Pakistan. I'm a practitioner in the rural area of Punjab, Pakistan, working on the empowerment, uh, resilience, and violence related issues in the background. Firstly, thank you very much for sharing your work with us. It was a beautiful work and quite a detailed information you shared with us. Now, I was just wondering that do you plan to take the work forward and conduct an impact with evaluation to gauge long term effects and the advantages of your findings to the community and around? Yes. Uh, do you think your initiative will sustain that? One question, and if you allow me, I can uh, go on with the second question also. Okay, go for it. <laughs> so, did you face any problems as a researcher during or after your uh, research? Because this research was focused on indigenous communities, and anything that challenges the already existing norms on, or you know, uh, any practice which is followed by in indigenous community, uh, the community doesn't, you know, tend to accept it uh, so easily. So, do you 
So in terms of just going back to the question on one thing um, or evaluation, um, this is something that I have actually done quite a lot of in recent times. So I just like in all of the kind of projects that I'm working, I kind of do some sort of monitoring and evaluation. And a lot of that evaluation has in two phases. Firstly, right at the end of whatever research project I'm working, but I've also been lucky enough to get funding to then go back after a couple of years. To go and see what you know what, what what's happened like you know has everyone just forgotten everything's on the bookshelf somewhere and gathering dust or uh, has actually anything happened so that is definitely an important part of what we do and i've actually used video as a way to do the monitoring and evaluation so i've used cross safety video as the tool and some of the peer researchers have also gone back and done that monitoring and evaluation so kind of building that into the whole process of doing the research both at the end of the project and then a few years later to go back and do that. So yes, in terms of that. In terms of have I faced any particular issues, I would say actually not in terms from Indigenous peoples. I think the areas in which I have faced problems are from non-Indigenous um, uh, you know, people in terms of, I think there is a lot of, um, unfortunately, you know, People don't, don't, there's a lot of people out there who see it as a threat if Indigenous people get rights to land, especially land. Um, and so it's mostly the kind of kind of issues or problems that I've had are with non Indigenous, indigenous people um, who feel that they're going to be, you know, yes, yeah, they're going to feel threatened by the fact that uh, land might be taken away or land might be used for other purposes or that, yeah. So I would say I've been lucky enough that I haven't had any issues actually with the community personally that I've worked with. So, yeah. Great. So I'm very conscious of time. I know there's other questions up there. People have had their hand up and I've, I've skipped over them and I apologize for that. But if you're okay to stay here maybe for a couple minutes, yeah. if people want to come down. So we now have 15 minutes in between um, the, the, the keynote and into the session. So we've got some time for you to go outside and finally i just want to say absolutely thank you for your amazing keynote to lead us off in the dsa it was absolutely brilliant so thank you so much we're taking time 15 minutes and then we've got the session starting after that <laughs> Yeah, 